We want to welcome our Facebook family. Great to have you um, joining us on our Wednesday night service. Um, we are excited about just jumping into God's word. Um, normally, we would be in the book of Deuteronomy. I was sharing this with our congregation, our live uh, congregation earlier. Um, normally, we'd be going through the book of Deuteronomy as usual, but today we're going to kind of be more informative and um, instructional about baptism. Um, we have several people who are signed up for water baptism this coming Sunday, and, um, and so we're going to be sharing the information of that. Now, those of you who are watching, if you are interested in professing your um, relationship with Christ publicly through baptism, you are more than welcome to join us. Uh, all you have to do is shoot a comment um, there in the comments, let us know that you're interested, and, um, or message us, um, and we will definitely get you all the information that you need to meet us this coming Sunday. And so, um, actually, let's start with a prayer. Father, we just want to say thank you for um, your love and your grace that you share with us, um, for your presence that you bring into this place as we gather together to just praise you. Um, as we get into your word, Lord, we pray that you just give us instruction and enlightenment to what your plan is for our life and your desire for us so that we can grow and, Lord, we can just continue to um, just uh, blossom as men and women of God in such a time as this. We're living in the last days, Lord, and there is no better time than to have come to Christ than right now and to declare our um, faith openly. And so I pray, Father, for, um, for all of that. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said... Amen. Well, guys, in the New Testament, Jesus prescribed two mandates. How many guys? Two. Two mandates that Jesus described in the New Testament that every Christian should adhere to. All right? The first one is called this. Everybody said out loud. It's called what? Communion. Say it again. What? Communion. So there are two mandates that before Jesus left, he made sure to um, give to us so that we're, we were to, you know, Kind of, he prescribed that we're to keep. And the first one is communion. And here's the verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24. It says, and when he, talking about Jesus, had given thanks, he broke it, talking about the bread, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Read this line, uh, line out loud with me. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So communion was the first mandate that Jesus gave us as, as, as Christians. And Jesus said, do this. Everybody say it out loud. What? Do this. Now, when he said do this, the phrase means to practice again and again. Not a one time have communion. He said, but do this. It means to practice it and do it again and again. Jesus also told us the duration, how often we should do this until he comes. Everybody said out loud, what? Until he comes. So do it often and do it until he comes. And he was speaking about the rapture of the church. When, the, you know, the event that Jesus promised that he would come and snatch his people away to be with him in heaven with the Father. So he said, this is the mandate I give you. 2,000 years ago, he gave the mandate, mandate, have communion. Do it often and keep doing it until I come. And he said, and then do it in remembrance of me. Say it out loud in what? In remembrance of me. So he gave us a reason. Hey, this is the reason to do it in remembrance of me as a reminder. Because, you know, we have the tendency of forgetting stuff. We have the tendency of getting tunneled vision and we, we forget. And so he said, I want you to do this. I want you to do communion often in remembrance of me. Jesus ordered us to take communion so that we never forget the incredible commitment and sacrifice that Jesus made for our salvation. Because the bread and the cup they both symbolize and signify something. We were told in the passage, the bread signifies his broken body, and the cup signifies his precious sinless blood. And so the idea is that he says, hey, listen, you to take communion 
as often as possible until I come in remembrance of me so that you never forget the incredible commitment and sacrifice that I made for you. It's for, to remind us of the love that Jesus had for us. Everybody say the word love. The love. John chapter 15 and verse 13, Jesus said it like this. Greater love has no one than this, than a man lay down one's life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And he, it, 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 it symbolizes his love. Communion does. That he, lay down, he laid down his life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says it like this. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, everybody out loud, Christ died for us. So he's saying this is what communion symbolizes and is a reminder of, is that sacrifice that Jesus made for us, his love for us. Communion is also a reminder of the commitment that he made to us. Not just as of, of his immense love in while we were yet sinners, he loved us by dying for us. But it also explains, this communion explains the commitment. It's a reminder of the commitment that he made for us. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, when you think about it, and you read this passage, you realize what, it, what he had to commit to even before Calvary came. Even before having to go through the it, you know, the extreme torture that he went through, it says this in Philippians 2, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He became one of us. He stepped out of that divine, wonderful, holy, perfect place called heaven and stepped into our debased degenerate, dark world. He gave up his divine privileges and he took up the humble position of a slave. Not even a king or a leader, but of a slave. And was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death. Not just any normal death. A criminal's death on a cross. Think about that commitment. Stepping out. Now, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was pressured to bail out of what was coming. Remember, he sweat great drops of blood. Under the weight and the pressure of, of what he, what he was going to have to go through. And he considered it, but he said, not my will be done, but your will be done. The commitment, when you think about it. Then there's Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Here was Jesus in the thick of his ministry. And here's what he said. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Whew. What a commitment. Jesus was not distracted, he never deviated, and he was never derailed from his mission. I mean, if there's anybody that can sing, hopelessly devoted to you, it's Jesus, man. The fact of that commitment that he made for us. All right, so communion, of course, is, is that showing of his love. It's a showing of his commitment. And also, communion, lastly, is a reminder of the cost of our salvation. I mean, the betrayal, the beating, the brutal crucifixion, the fact that he became sin on the cross. And that's why he, he was even dying the criminal's death. Why would God ask him to die a criminal's death? Because he himself, because of our sin, would be a criminal to God. Wow. Wow. And he bore that on that Friday that we talked about. And we know that, it, that, that God separated himself. It was the first time that Jesus had ever been separated from his father, where God had said, where God just kind of stepped away from him, turned away from him. And Jesus cried and said, my God, no longer father. My God, the relationship was broken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
So he went through all of that, and that's, that's what the, 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 the broken body signifies, the broken bread, just like the broken body and this, the, 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 blood, the wine that signifies the blood that was spilled. He was abandoned by God, and he died. He died. Now, the fact that you and I know how it ended, it steals a little bit from it. Had we been the disciples there uh, or, or, or had, had known that Jesus was dying or John being John at the foot of the cross and watched Jesus die and the soldier go and thrust the spear into his heart, it, for us, we would have acted exactly like those disciples who were on the road to Emmaus, totally disappointed, totally blown away that you know the one who we thought was the Son of God, the one who we thought that would redeem us, the one who we thought that was Messiah, he's dead. You guys get it, right? And that's why he says, I want to remind you of the, of what, co the, the communion, remind you of the love that I have for you, the commitment I made for you, and the sacrifice that I made. Why does he want us to remember the sacrifice? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says it like this. That's why he was adamant about reminding us. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Until you come to the reality of those three things, that God, Jesus loves you, that he committed himself to you, and that he sacrificed himself for you, you really can't be saved. You can have religion. You can be a churchy. You can be a lot of things. But saved you can't be until you understand that he loves you, that he committed himself to you, and that he shed his blood so that you, he took your penalty so that you could be free. So that's why. So Jesus' complete sacrifice is what makes salvation and forgiveness and adoption into God's family available. I mean, the, the, the childhood or the, the kids' church song what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus is our song too. Right? All right. Here's something. The New Testament church, after Jesus was crucified and died, they followed Jesus' mandate to have communion faithfully. I mean, they, they, they followed it. In fact, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 they, they did what Jesus said. Here's what it says. Read it with me. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So after Jesus resurrected from the church, sent down the Holy Spirit, resurrected from the dead, ascended, and sent down the Holy Spirit, the church was born, right? Peter goes out on the day of Pentecost. He preaches a message. 3,000 people come to the Lord Jesus, believe in Jesus' sacrifice, and they are gloriously forgiven, they're saved, and they're adopted into God's family, right? Now understand that. The church began. So now they were, began to follow up with the mandates that Christ had given. And so one of them is they, they, they continued steadfastly in, first of all, doctrine, the, the, you know, in, in, in Scripture, in the teaching of God's Word. So they got together, just like we do, to learn God's word, to go through it, and to understand it. So they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and then in fellowship. What's the next thing? Everybody said out loud, what? Fellowship. What is fellowship? It is serving and, 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 and experiencing Christian life together. So they continue steadfastly in learning they continue steadfastly in serving and experiencing Christian life together in interacting brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? And they continue steadfastly in the breaking of bread, which was the symbolism of communion. Every time they got together, there's, they heard God's word, they mingled with one another, and they fellowshiped with one another. They were doing Christian life. They were encouraging one another. They were strengthening one another. They were building up one another. And also, they always remembered. It was, it was the centerpiece. Jesus' sacrifice was the centerpiece and should always be the centerpiece of our Christian life. Right? So they followed the mandate. They continued steadfastly in all of those things. 
Now, here's the second mandate. Everybody say what? The what? The, sec the second mandate that Jesus gave us is this. Everybody say it out loud. Bapt there you go. It's baptism. So Jesus, before he leaves, he says two things I really want to emphasize that you do. One, of course, he, you know, outside of the commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, because they will know that you are my disciples because you love one another, right? And he said, but here's another mandate I give you, communion. It'd be the, center, the centerpiece of your Christian faith. And then he says, this next mandate is baptism. Here's the verse, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Out loud together, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So go out and teach. Now, now, now after he resurrected, he said, this is the second mandate, go out and preach, talk, share, testify about me. Tell people about what I, who I am and what I've done and the experience that you've had with me. Tell them that. He said, and then when the people, be, they, they come to faith, then they should be baptized. Baptism is a public declaration of our faith and an identification with Jesus. See, communion was a picture of Jesus choosing us. Baptism is a picture of us choosing him. You guys get that, right? So communion was that. Him is a picture of him choosing us, but baptism is a picture of us choosing him. In the mandate, Jesus described who should be baptized. Who? Everybody say, who? 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 Sounds like that. Sounds like a bunch of banana monkeys. Who? Who? Here we go. He said, who should be, who should be baptized? Everybody said out loud. Believers. Believers in Jesus who have confessed him as their Savior. See, nowhere in the Bible can you find infant baptism. Baptism is for those who believe. Every time baptism is related in the scriptures, it's always talking towards adults who, who believe, who can comprehend, who can decide, and who can choose, and who can subscribe to follow Jesus for themselves. See, because your parents can't choose for you. A priest or a pastor can't choose for you. A spouse can't choose for you. They'll try, but they can't. They can't. Every individual must choose Jesus for themselves. And when and so those are the people. When you do, those are the people that should be baptized. Because the next is when. When should they be baptized? Any time after you have believed and confessed Christ as your Savior. So we know who should be baptized, those who have believed and have put their faith in Christ. And when should they be baptized? Anytime after they've believed and confessed Christ as Savior. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, says it like this. Those who believed what Peter preached were baptized and added to the church that day. So the sooner the better that you can, you know, be baptized. But it's not always convenient. It's not always that readily available. So, hey, the, soon, the first time they have a baptism, that's the time to get back. If you haven't been baptized, then what are you waiting for? Right? So when should you be baptized? After you've professed your faith in Christ. See, baptism should be the next step in your Christian walk after confessing Jesus. There's a story in the book of Acts where this disciple of Jesus, his name was Philip, who he had, um, you know, he, he was having great success in preaching in a, an area of Samaria, which um, an area of Israel where, um, you know, nobody cared about these people because they were considered not, you know, not, not, not Jewish. So he went there and he preached Jesus and many of them came to the Lord. I mean, they were bringing their, 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 their books of, uh, of witchcraft, and they were bringing their, their, their 
Playboy magazines or their pornography or whatever it was. They were throwing them. They were, they were giving all that up. They were saying, we're done with that. And it was a revival. In fact, that's where the word is used. Revival happen, happening there. And it was awesome. But the Lord spoke to Philip and says, I need for you to be somewhere else. Which was on the road, which from him was across from Jerusalem, I'm going to say roughly 120 miles. I need for you to be over there in the Negev real quick. And then somehow Philip was transported over there. But he shows up, and he's there, and there is an Ethiopian that had been there for, during the, the, the Passover when the Holy Spirit had descended. He was walking back. He had been there for Passover, and, 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 he, and, and he hadn't received anything, and, and he really didn't get anything. And so all he did is buy a scroll of Isaiah, the prophet. So he's reading the book of Isaiah on his way back, and Philip comes up next to him because he gets transported there, and he says, hey, um, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian guy says, nah, I, don't ha I don't understand it. I, I mean, I'm here in Isaiah 53 where it's talking about this man who is going to be sacrificed and, 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 and who is going to take the sins of the world, and, 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 but I don't make sense of this. Wow. Isn't that how God kind of orchestrates things? You just happen to be reading the passage of Scripture that talked about Jesus and his sacrifice. And Peter says, I'm your huckleberry, man. I can tell you what that passage means. I love when God does divine appointments that way. Now, Philip knew that what was going on, but the, 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 the Ethiopian didn't know. And so he said, so can you explain it to me? Philip told him about Christ. And the Bible says that that Ethiopian... He confessed Christ Jesus as his Savior right then and there, got off the wagon that he was on, got off the wagon and confessed Christ. And then he says, well, I want to be baptized. Because see, baptism was always the next step, was a public commitment of your devotion that you've chosen Christ, your identification with Christ. And he wanted to do it right away. And all there was, and they're in the neg Negev, so... I'm, I'm assuming it had just been after the rainy season. All there is is like just a puddle of water. And he says, I want to be baptized. And so Philip takes him over there and baptizes him in that puddle. Because it doesn't matter how clear the water is. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't have to be, you know, so deep, so this, so that, so perfect. Because it's the, symboli the symbolism of it, which that brings us to the next point of why, what is the purpose for being baptized? Well, it's because of the symbolism that is involved there. It is the fact that you have died with Christ, that you are buried with him in baptism, and that now you're like Jesus, going to come, rise up, and live a resurrected life like Jesus, right? So, um, so, so the, the Ethiopian, he wanted that. And, and now it describes what, what is baptism. Baptism is that public declaration to the Lord above, to everyone here on earth, to all the devil and the demons from beneath. It's telling all of them that you have chosen Jesus and are committing to live a resurrected life. That's a baptism. You know, that's, that, that's what it is, a declaration of your faith. See, before our faith in Jesus, we were living in darkness, in depravity and death. But when we believe in Jesus our Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit birthed a new life within us just like he did for Jesus at his resurrection from the dead. And I talked about it on Sunday. It's the same Spirit that brought Jesus back to life is the same Spirit that brings new life on the inside of us when we confess Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Here's the verse, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. This is scriptural. It says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Wow. So when we believed and confessed to follow Jesus, we were regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We became born again. Paul says a new creation in Christ just as Jesus was in the tomb. 
And just like Jesus came out of the grave, we're also to come out of the grave and live resurrected lives. Listen to Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? This is talking about, Paul was talking about Christians, people who have given their heart and life to Christ and just have just become Christians. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as, we, uh, as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. So baptize, baptism symbolizes being buried with Christ in his death and being raised with him in resurrection. Just as Jesus committed to die for you, you and baptism are committing to live for him. At baptism, we're professing to live a new life. We're saying... I am becoming identified with him. I want to be a part, and I'm making it public. Because, you know, we need to tell, let people know where we stand when it comes to Christ. It's like, I, I forget the name of that one baseball player. He, he, was, he was playing for the San Francisco Giants, and then he got, um, he played there for, I think it was 10, 11 years, and then he became a free agent, and he went to go play for the Dodgers. And he's playing for the Dodgers, and when, you know, when finally the Dodgers were going to play the San Francisco Giants, well, he walked out on the field as a Dodger, and he had been in, you know, uh, San Francisco for so long. And, and there were this, the, 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 the stadium was very undecided. Half of them booed him, and the other half cheered him, you know, because, I mean, he was our player. He was our guy. And, but then he went over, and this player went over and hugged put his arm around Tommy Lasorda, and gave him a big hug. And now all the cheers from the San Francisco Giants were all boos. You understand, he identified. I'm not one of you anymore. I'm with these guys. And that's what baptism is also saying to the Lord. It's saying to the world. It's saying to all the devil and, uh, the devil and his demons. I'm no longer with you. I'm with him. I'm embracing him. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Isn't that awesome, guys? That's what baptism is. It's that symbol. Now, baptism doesn't save us. It was that confession in Christ, that believing and confessing by faith in Jesus Christ, that and his grace saved us. Baptism is just making that public, saying, this is what happened on the inside. I'm letting the whole world know where I stand. That's what baptism is all about. It's saying, it's professing that we're going to live a new life and new options and new attitudes and we're going to have new accomplishments. You know, before I was, I, I, you know, I wanted to see how many, how many, Pong, beer pong things I could win. How many, how many of this I could do? How many, how many of this I could get done? How many notches in my belt or whatever that, that stuff was? I have a different accomplishment. How much I can become more like Christ every day that I grow. How I can overcome that unforgiveness in my life. How I can overcome that, that besetting sin in my life. How I can get rid of this stuff and how I can become more like Christ. And the awesome thing about it is that we have the Holy Spirit helping us. That after we've made that decision, and after we've confessed Christ, the Holy Spirit's on the inside. He's the one that's prompting you to be baptized because it's that, that public statement. It's the next step. And he's working with you. He works with us from justification into sanctification and into glorification. What that means is when I confess Jesus Christ, I am justified just as if I'd never sinned. And he helps me understand that. 
And then he helps me with sanctification. What does that mean? That I am set apart for the Lord. Doesn't mean I'm perfect or sinless. You will never be that. Look at your neighbor and say, mm. but he will help you grow and become more like Christ until the day of glorification. Remember, and I talked about it on Sunday, when we will finally be redeemed. That's the completion of our redemption. We were justified. I got saved from the penalty of sin. I am sanctified. I am being saved from the power of sin. And I will be glorified for I am saved from the presence of sin when I go home to be with the Lord. So that's what baptism is about. Did you, did, did you kind of get it? All right. Here's the last verse of the evening. Ephesians chapter 4. And here's what it is. Verse 1. I therefore, Paul was writing, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Here it is. Let's read this part out loud. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I'm begging you, I'm urging you to walk in this manner. This is resurrected life right here. To be humble. Which goes against the grain in our lives because we're proud and arrogant and, you know, self-seeking, narcissists. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you right now. But I got to walk with humility. I gotta, it's not about me. I got to walk with gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love and eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Did you learn something tonight? I hope so. All right, so here's what we're going to do at this point. We're just going to say so long to our Facebook uh, audience. Would you guys give them a cheer? Just cheer them out. Uh, guys, thank you for joining us.